Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, webinar on AI for Sustainable Logistics and Supply Chain Management, which is organized by FKI, the Finnish Center for AI. I'm Ville Kyrki from Alta University, and I'm acting as the host of this webinar. Uh, and to start with, let's take a look first at our program today. We have four speakers today, uh, Ville Hinka, Laura Ruotsalainen, Pekka Ylipaunu and Aki Elovehmas. The first two speakers are from uh, FKI research organizations and the two uh, from industry. We'll start uh, from the research perspective and then move to the industry one today. So next slide, please. So uh, some logistical issues about the seminar. So we welcome uh, questions and comments. Uh, and we have reserved a few minutes after each talk for discussion. Please use the Q&A tool uh, to ask your questions, uh, th because this will allow the speakers to answer them after their presentation. We've also uh, already received many questions during the registration process, and we'll cover some of these during the discussions, depending on available time. Final uh, logistical issue is that please note that this webinar will be recorded. So AI uh, is one of the uh, transforming technologies of, of this decade. And uh, the, the topic of today's seminar, Sustainable Logistics Supply Chain, chain Management, uh, combines uh, two important uh, transformations. Uh, they're going towards sustainability and using the AI as the transforming force. So, uh, Without uh, uh, spending more time on the introduction, uh, let's start uh, with the first speaker. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ville Hinka, the team leader of intelligent supply chain uh, uh, chains and logistics teams at VTT. Okay, hello. As another, Ville said, I'm, I'm working for VTT as a research team leader and, and I'm going to tell you about challenges of future supply chain management and the possibilities of artificial intelligence to contribute for these, these challenges. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and as already presented, uh, Sustainability is uh, currently a big, big driver for supply chain management. And if you start by thinking about what is supply chains, well, supply chains they are entity of several companies, and the important is that supply chains they compete against each other, not single companies inside the supply chain. And also, the supply chain is the uh, as as strong as uh, its weakest link. Link is. And traditionally, a successful supply chain is, for example, cost efficient, flexible, and responsible. But nowadays, it should also be sustainable. And the aim of the supply chain management is to make the entire supply chain as efficient as possible. And there has been a discussion about 10 years, recent last 10 years, about su sustainable supply chain management. And it has got a lot of attention, but there are no, no clear definition about its content so far. Next slide, slide please. There's something about dilemma between supply chain management and sustainability. Well, the investment, supply chain management investment, they are long-term investments. For example, operating age of, of freight vessel is decades. For port equipment, it's at least 15 years, and so on. So, majority of the current logistic infrastructure, they have many operational years of use, but most of them are no longer sustainable enough. So, to become more sustainable, there is a lot of need for more investments. But, but these investments, of course, they need 
money and and all all these improvements in supply chain sustainability they increase the operating cost at least temporarily and in that way they decrease competitiveness of the of the entire chain and in practice when a single company they considers investing in sustainability they have the following challenges well the producing sustainable services cost more but other customers for example manufacturers distributors retailers are they willing to pay extra for this sustainability and unfortunately the situation is that until recently for the for the, this service buy, buyers the only thing that matters has been cost despite the fact what, what they have written about in in their sustainability reports or so on and when a logistics is a business with low margins so so it's also the challenge for this logistics companies that does these investments towards sustainability lead to financial problems and and on the other hand if there is if someone who is needing logistics services they want to buy sustainable services are they able to find these these services or if they are able to find them somewhere they will cost a little bit more but if the, if it's also take take more effort to get these services so the, it it will be a be also 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 challenge next slide please however there are currently big drivers for for sustainability well we know that uh, that was a little bit less than two years ago european union agreed finally this green deal that uh, where the eu european union is committed to to have a 55 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and uh, and achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 and then finland uh, has set the target to achieve carbon ne neutrality already by 20 35. So for, for for example, the port equipment that that the Finnish ports are currently purchasing, they are still in operational use in 2035. And this needs to be taken into consideration that this, uh, these requirements. However, for transport and logistics sector, we know that they are big producers of CO2 emissions. But they have not been. This industry has not been pressured to improve, improve the situation until recently. For example, this international agreement related to, to reducing CO2 emissions in global level. They have not been. Uh, for example, international air and waterborne transport have not been included in these agreements, and therefore, it has been estimated that, for example, the the share of uh, waterborne transport of uh, in uh, when global CO2 emissions will uh, its share will increase dramatically during the following decades. However, Europe in European Union there is now upcoming standards where comp uh, where in the first phase the big companies they need to report not only their direct emissions which they have already reported so far the scope one emissions and scope two emissions which are the emissions of their used energy but they also need to report their scope three emissions and the scope three emissions mean that they need to to report also the emissions of their subcontracting and logistics services they are a big share of their subcontracting so so these logistics uh, emissions they will become visible uh, at least in the first place in the European Euro European level, and hopefully, hopefully quite soon in the also in the global level. Next slide, please. But the challenge is. Uh, Obviously, there is a need for improving sustainability of supply chain, especially by concentrating on transport between supply chain echelons. And also this upcoming regulation, they will hi highlight if the sustainability performance of the supply chain is poor. However, the progress is, is slow. 
and usually we have noticed that there are usually more, more talks than actual actions. For, usually the companies they take sustainability actions when they are beneficial for them. For example, this is just just an imaginary examples that, for example, shipping company they, they may say that they, uh, they decrease their emissions by ordering their ships go slower. However, of course, this this will produce some some savings, but they would get much more bigger savings if they con concentrate, for example, engine technologies or used fuel. But but these kind of savings they would require much more bigger investments, and and probably the the reason for this uh, that the vessel goes slower is 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 so that uh, that the that the shipping companies they have less less cargo cargo to transport and usually the, the situation is so that that the companies say that they, they make these sustainability improvements when it's beneficial for them of course by improving their routes route making route optimization improving utilization rate they of, they save fuel and of, of course in, in that way they also also save money for companies, but when companies need to invest something, then the situation is, is different. And also, when we know that in, in one, one year ago, when this global situation changed and, and this Russia attack to Ukraine, there was this kind of sanctions became visible and, and so on, and, and there were become problems of availability of fossil fuels. Instead of, of getting this as, a, as an option for transition to renewable energy sources, the industry instead demanded tax reduction in general and search alternative sources for fossil fuels, instead of making this kind of, of transition to renewable energy. Okay, next slide, please. Well, uh, my point is that uh, that the challenge for artificial intelligence challenge what what we are what, what where would artificial intelligence contribute is that how could logic industry change its mi mindset and adopt operational models that will significantly improve the sustainability of supply chains. Our team is is concentrating on this these questions. However, we are not experts in artificial intelligence. We are not using that, that tool, but we are, we are trying to contribute for this, this challenge by using so-called traditional research methods. But by introducing this, this challenge, I would like to hear that how could your experts in artificial intelligence could help help us to to, con to solve it and contribute for this problem. Next slide, please. So, so I, I believe that to to solve this problem, it it needs out of the box thinking. The logistics industry itself it not may not be able to do that. And and for example, there are some. Some approaches where artificial intelligence kind of solution could take into place. For example, so the first approach would be that what kind of what would trigger the investments towards new sustainable sustainable supply uh, supply chain management solutions and practices. As I already said, that the companies they have difficulties to to make this investment because they it will. They are afraid that they will lose their position in the supply chain. They, they will have financial problems. They will lose their margins, and they will go into financial problems. Then the second approach would be that different supply chain actors they have different motivations. Like there are there are company who has recently invest, invested in in infrastructure which is becoming which is with a bit too polluting. In the current environment, but they do not want to to have make new investment investments, 
and so on. So what kind of decisions would share the cost and benefits of different actors in a way that motivates everyone to participate in transition towards more sustainable operations? And also, also most probably these new more sustainable practices, they need new kind of technologies and new technologies, they change the, uh, when adopting these technologies, the position and, uh, and power between supply chain actors, they will change. And of course, those companies whose power, relative power will decrease, they are against this every, every movement, movement, every, every development efforts. And then the third alternate uh, approach could be that, that the trans transition period towards new operation models is a vulnerable period for the company. And how the company could overcome this period and to prevent this, this brave companies who, who would like to make, th make this investment. Uh, how, how, how they would avoid the situation of, of fi financial problem and failing. So, next slide, please. Well, if these challenges, if they if you th think that they are a little bit too high, le high level and so on, I will also, in, this, in the end of my presentation, I will also, also raise some of the more so-called traditional supply chain management problems where artificial in intelligence also could contribute. For example, this route optimization is the, is the long, has been a long time a big problem, and now, now when at the same time trying to minimizing emissions, is the one, one thing that where artificial intelligence will certainly, certainly contribute. Then, the next one is perhaps how to create intelligent cargo that finds its route from sender to receiver. For example, if if I want to travel somewhere, I, I, I take this kind of route, uh, for example, Google, and, and take, take this kind of route, route suggestions, and I, I will select, select which kind of transportation modes I take, where, where to go bus, and, and so on. But how would car, cargo do that itself, that there is no, no need for Someone outsider to, to find out that where, where the cargo lies and how to, how to move them. Would it be possible that the, that the cargo itself or product itself find its roots and go, go to the right place or order, order the right transportation? Then, of course, the optimal packaging and unloading of the truck, container, and so on. We have typical artificial intelligence challenges. Then, adaptive layout for warehouses, container field, and so on. Like, like usually in warehouses, there are fixed places for certain, certain products. But of course, the situation changes that there are, there are season, seasonal changes and so on. And like, like the warehouses sometimes empty or sometimes more full of products. How, how good this, this warehouse places or container field places or or every other, other places could, could, be, could be adaptive. And then, like the self-driving equipment, trucks, vessels, how could artificial intelligence contribute for that, that development? Because it, it will take a little bit more time when, when there are in, in public roads, there are, there are like self-driving taxis. But for example, port environment, it's closed, closed yard. It's, it, it, there is so already possible to, to implement these kind of self-driving vehicles, and all, many ports have already done that. But there are many, many challenges that artificial intelligence could contribute. Okay. Thank you for your attention. It was my presentation. I'm, I'm willing to and happy to happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much, Ville. So uh, I can start uh, reading the questions uh, that we have gathered uh, already before. But just as a reminder, please use the Q&A tool if you have any further questions. And we'll try to see if we can cover all of the things uh, we have gathered so far.
So maybe to set the, uh, oh, talking about sustainability, uh, sustainability in, in traditionally thought of as primarily as an environmental aspect of the sustainability, but uh, the sustainability has also the economic and social aspect. So yeah. uh, do you have a view on if uh, in logistics industry, uh, these other aspects, I'm probably economic uh, aspect is quite clear, but whether the social sustainability aspect uh, is something that the logistics uh, and supply chain management industries uh, are considering. Yes, yes, that's a very important question, because, for example, even if, if there is a tendency to, to decrease people people uh, manual work and uh, move towards automation there are still uh, is there's still a lot of manual work work and uh, and this this work is very very hard hard work and also also it's dangerous like like por like port work steve door working is is one of the most dangerous dangerous work in the work and there are almost almost every year in, for example, in Finland, there is fa fatal fatal accident accident in port. So, so th this is very very important question that, that how to how to improve sec uh, safety safety of this work. Of course, there is a lot of in, in transportation in, in road transportation. There are many fatal fatal accident annually annually and, and so so on so so this is this is one thing and and also also another thing that that how to how to make this automation and decrease of manual manual workers so so that there are not big uh, not many people go unemployed but at the, at the same time ensure that there is uh, there is enough workers available in in this sector so this is this very, very important thing. Thanks. Uh, so you also talked about the industrial incentives for uh, for sustainability. And so, do you see that there uh, is risk for using AI just to maximize profits, even if that proves unsustainable? And how do you see whether? There are certain this kind of risks related to sustainability and, and AI. Yes, yes, there is one because because, because the the cost it, it has been a very very big driver for the for this logistics industry. So 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 we know we know because we have worked in this industry as our team members have worked in this and and when we talk talk about confidentially with, with these logistics managers. They, they just said that, that even if they have sustainability report and they say that that they are aiming for supply chain sustainability, still when they are making decisions related to buying logistics services, the cost is the most important factor. And and when when the cost is the most important factor and, and this and at this new New kind of digitalization. It enables, for example, subcontracting from from abroad. We can. It's much more easier to use use foreign companies and so on. And and these companies, they they may be out of any any regulations that we have, for example, in Finland, we have in EU and so on. So so it's it's real challenge that we, for example, use use the company which which is. Which is uh, headed, uh, managed outside European Union, for example, and has doesn't have this kind of sustainability regulations that that we have. So it is really really a challenge. Uh, challenge. And, uh, so you talk also about different aspect of supply chain management where AI could prove to be a good solution. Do yeah. you think there are some aspects of supply chain management where AI would not prove to be a good solution? Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's an interesting question that I have not not talked about. Uh, well, there are 
like like related to this safety safety things that uh, that perhaps it's so, so far that so far the human is uh, no, knows the knows the situation that perhaps can well if ai doesn't work properly it can be the, it can cause uh, cause big accidents for example and so on because because the human human they have they know how how to how to do in for example in in a situation that looks looks dangerous or, or, uh, or something like that it, of course if if the artificial intelligence would work perfectly it is it's much much better and uh, it doesn't make human errors but but the challenge is that if it doesn't work so well there, there is some kind of mistakes inside the inside the logic of the, the ai so it might might cause a big big uh, big disaster or big accident so I imagine that that may also relate to uh, cases where, for example, regulations require there to be a responsible person uh, that might uh, cause challenges. So how do you see the role of the regulators and authorities in uh, promoting the development of sustainable logistics? Well, how, how should they act, the authorities should act, and how should they provide incentives? What, what are the uh, most important things you, you see? Yeah, I, I think there is uh, both carrot and uh, carrot and stick is needed. So there might, uh, would be that kind of something that would would, would motivate uh, positively way way for for companies to adopt these things. But al also there needs to be regulations that, for example, the limits for for emissions that this cannot be exceeded, or there would be big fines fines to exceed this limit. And, and there is a need need for for this kind of um, monitoring, monitoring, better monitoring this, the, uh, this uh, limit, limits and emissions and and everything. So, so I, I think both both are needed. And per, perhaps this, if it's if some some companies is, for example, more sustainable than than the regulations. So it can, for example, get some tax reductions or or something else that would motivate the companies. Because in in the long term, the regulations are tightening, tightening all the time. And if if some some companies are, for example, ahead of these regulations, so it it would be good that they would get some kind of compensation, which which would motivate motivate the companies to be be a forerunners instead of just reacting. As, as late as possible for these upcoming regulations. Okay, thank you so much, Ville. We are running out of time. Uh, so please, Ville, I ask you to also check the Q&A tool. Yeah. And if there are some more questions that we were not able to cover fully uh, in this discussion, but uh, that Ville will try to answer or provide at least some answers to the questions and also for for the rest of the audience please feel free to use the q and a tool all the time during the presentations so thank you ville and we thank move you. on next to our next speaker laura rotelainen laura is a social professor at the department of computer science at the university of helsinki and helsinki institute of sustainability science and i uh, laura is also uh, responsible uh, for uh, sustainable sustainability program within the uh, Finnish Center of AI. Laura, please. Okay, thank you, Ville, and, and good morning, everyone. So I'm I'm now today uh, going to talk about one a, a bit more practical example of how AI is used for sustainability, and I'm going to talk about case Connect Cranes. So we are working in collaboration with Connect Cranes. Okay, but but there was a really good uh, kind of like background information already from the discussions between Willis about uh, sustainability. 
So, so as already was mentioned, so sustainability is not only addressing the, the uh, environmental issues, which of course are, are very relevant and, and very critical at the moment also, but, but also the social and, and then the economical aspects of sustainability has to be addressed. And the United Nations has defined uh, sustainable development goals, so 17 different goals that has to be addressed very fast to, to get uh, things to, to be in a good state for the whole world and, and, and the whole society. And it is also quite clear that, that artificial intelligence is one of the key enables of uh, reaching these sustainability goals. So, so there has been uh, done quite, quite um, extensive studies looking at how the different AI uh, innovations, how do they then contribute to achieving these sustainable development goals. A, a very interesting paper was published three years ago in Nature publication. And then they found out we have very kind of like detailed analysis that AI is acting as an enabler for 169 targets among the 17 sustainable development goals and inhibiting 59. So of course there is always the other side of the coin also in AI uh, development and then utilization. And the strength of artificial intelligence is, of course, that it is able to process huge amount of data with very fast pace. It is able to look, for example, at the images with the details that the human eye can't look at. And also AI is able to do various simulations without intervening with the nature or the societies. And then the analysis that were done were surprisingly also finding out that the largest positive impact of AI is on, on the sustainable development goals that are addressing climate. But as we all know, so, so, so there are many things that have to be corrected and fast, meaning that we need sustainability transformations. And for the sustainability transformations, we also need big systemic changes. And, and for um, logistics, uh, one big systemic change is, of course, automation. And, and there also we know already, based on, on the previous discussion, that, that artificial intelligence is one of the key enablers for automation. And then uh, for, for the case Connect Cranes, so, so we are working for enabling the autonomous operation of the cranes also in indoor industrial premises. And then for making these sustainable, so we of course have to address the safety of everyone inside the industrial areas. So we need to know where the cranes are, so, so we have to localize those very accurately indoors. So we have to also understand the environment, so we must know where all the other people and all the other objects are in the environment to avoid any crashes. But then we have some challenges. So when we are, for example, uh, working with cranes that are on kind of like the uh, ceiling, so then we have the situation where our cameras are looking down. And then I, I will be soon explaining why this is a bit, big challenge also for, for using the cameras for getting localization of the cranes. And then, uh, well, computer vision is then the technology that we are using for, for doing the uh, localization of the cranes and also understanding the environment because they provide uh, very good data for those purposes. And already at the moment, there are uh, kind of like optical system based automated uh, systems, of course, also in industrial premises, but they are mainly based on using uh, expensive equipment that also consume quite a lot quite much power. So for example, uh, laser scanners. And, and also to achieve these sustainability goals, we want to do uh, the computation, the localization of the cranes and also understanding of the environment efficiently and by using low cost equipment. And, and with, with systems that also have very low power consumption. And this then means that we should be using the simple monocular digital cameras for doing all these processes. And of course, when we want to then use these low cost equipment that also don't kind of like have the full understanding of, of environments, and I, I will come back to, to what I mean with that, and, and also uh, kind of like then introduce some errors for the computation, we need to have artificial intelligence. And in our case, 
we are using machine learning, so deep learning, and then cameras, so computer vision, for computing the, the location of, of the uh, crane and also forming a map of the environment at the same time. So we are doing something called uh, visual simultaneous localization and mapping, so SLAM process. And then also we need to know what there is in the environment. And, and therefore we are doing something called instant segmentation. So, so you probably know a lot about object detection already, so, so being able to detect and locate objects from images. But what we need to do in, in this case is we need to know not just the bounding boxes around the objects in the environment that is usually the result of object detection, but we need to know all kind of like what is in each of the pixels of the image to really know the boundaries of the objects in the environment. And also the challenge is that we need to do know that in three dimensions. So we need to know the exact location of all the objects found from the images with respect to the crane. And then this is now, now again creating the challenge as, as previously mentioned. But so when we are thinking about using the computer vision and understanding the, the motion of the crane, so, so uh, we are able to detect features from the images. And then we are able to, to kind of a compute how the features in the images move across uh, consecutive images, so an image sequence. And, and, and this information brings us knowledge about the motion of the camera. And then when we have the camera attached to the crane, so also about the, the motion of the crane or any uh, autonomous system in the environment. And uh, therefore, we, we are kind of like uh, use. Uh, methods uh, that are similar to, to the visual simultaneous localization and mapping structure from motion. And then the reason why I'm using the, the different terminology for quite similar uh, method will also be clear from, from when talking about our uh, deep learning methods that we have been developing. But, but before going to the methods that we have been developing, let's still look a bit back to the challenges that there are in, in the kind of like perception of the environment. So as I said already, so to be able to really get the, the actual uh, location and motion of the crane, and also to understand the objects in the environment well enough, we need to know the distance to all these objects and, and, and the features that we are tracking to compute the location. But the monocular cameras, uh, they uh, kind of like get challenges from something called depth issue. They are not able to detect the distance to the objects in the env environment or the features that we are tracking to get the motion, which means that we get an ambiguous scale in the motion. And also we are not able to detect the objects or the instances with, with the distance information. So that we don't get the 3D uh, object detection uh, solution. And well, deep learning has been used a lot also to be able to understand the depth of the environment, things that we see in the environment. But the challenge is that the existing methods, they always use some, some visual cues arising from the environment. So, so the methods have been mainly developed for autonomous driving. And when we have vehicles, we always know where the ground is. And then we are able to detect the horizon, for example, from the images and we are able to understand the vertical locations of the, the objects in the environment. But now that we are using cranes and we have the cameras that are looking down from, from kind of like the constructions from the ceilings, we are not really, uh, we, we are not able to use this information, the visual cues, the horizon line or the vertical locations, because we are looking everything from the bird's view. And then here you can, for example, see an example of how humans are detected from images. So they lose all the human-like uh, representation when we have the camera uh, pointing downwards. Okay, so, so what, how are we then addressing the issue? So as I said, we need to localize the crane. And, and uh, for that, we need to know the depth of all the objects in the environment to be able then to track the motion of these features that we have detected. And then, as said, we are using monocular cameras, so we are not able to do this uh, with, with just using the monocular camera and the information that comes straight out from there. 
So therefore, we have been working with something called structure from motion learner. So, so uh, an architecture that has two deep learning networks that at the same time are able to understand the motion of the crane and the depth of, of the objects in the environment. And when it's using uh, kind of like combining this information from the two different networks, the other one providing the depth and then the other one, the motion information, we are then able to get all the information into the scale and we are then able to to understand the motion of, of the crane. And so, of course, when we are working with practical kind of like environments and, and practical problems, we, we wanted to test it. And then so we have been collaborating with Alta University, who has this Ilmatar test crane in their premises. And we have been putting our cameras to, to the test crane there and have been collecting then images of surrounding environment and then computing the motion and especially now uh, resolving the depth of the environment. And then for doing that, we have been using very uh, cheap cameras, so these real sense Intel cameras for collecting the images, and, and then a LiDAR, so laser scanner, for then getting the ground truth for our computation. And by doing that, we have been able to get very good depth estimation of, of the surroundings. So here you can see pictures of, of uh, the um, kind of like the, the um, traditional structure from a learner. Uh, technologies architectures on the top view. So, so there is the original image, what the camera sees on left, then the prediction, what, what the depth is predicted in the middle, and then on the round, uh, right uh, image, the ground truth. And then below is, is the architecture that we have been uh, improving, developing further, also providing the same information. And then when doing the very uh, kind of like detailed um, a quantitative analysis of the results we have been sh shown to also outperform the previous kind of like methods computing the, the structure from motion, so the, the motion of the crane in the environment by using uh, images only. But then, of course, when we are kind of like uh, working in, in uh, kind of like realistic environments, we are addressing many other challenges also than arising only from, from computing the motion and understanding the environment otherwise. So, so there are, for example, many different things that, that disturb then the camera perception. So for example, we are suffering from something called non-Lambertian surfaces. So there are shiny objects in the environment that disturb the understanding from the images. And then also we, have, we are addressing some areas where there are no feature, so we can't see any exact objects in the images that we could be using for then computing the motion and understanding the environment. So these are also things that have to be addressed, and then we are using artificial intelligence methods for address those challenges. Then few words still about then the uh, kind of like the 3D object understanding. So knowing what there is in the environment, and especially then understanding the uh, relationship of the position of the objects in the environment with respect to ourselves, so with respect to the crane. And as I said, we now want to kind of like know the information on pixel level, and we want to know the distance, which is again the challenge when we are using these monocular cameras. And still again thinking we also have this very atypical perspective when we have the uh, cameras on the ceiling. So we can't really use any existing large open source data sets for doing our uh, deep learning method development. And so everyone who has been working with, with um, machine learning, deep learning knows that, that one of the big challenges is that the more data we have, of, of the, the situations that we want to model, the better models we get. And, and the better model improves almost linearly until kind of like we have 300 million images to do the training. And, and also in, in machine learning, in deep learning, we need to label each image to, to get kind of like the correct um, answer of what the model should be learning to the, be then able to train the model if we are using supervised methods. And, and that's quite laborious. So when we are labeling the images, so for example, when we are doing the simple classification task, so wanting to know if there is a cat or dog in the image, it takes 20 seconds to label one image. 
when we want to do the object detection. So we want to know what are what are the objects in the image and where they are roughly inside a bounding box. So, so then it takes 38 uh, seconds to label one image. But when we want to do this instance segmentation, so we want to label all the pixels, it takes four minutes per image. And of course, now that we don't have existing data sets, we need actual data to do our own training, to, to kind of like develop our own architectures. This is really a huge bottleneck. And then therefore, at the moment, we are developing weekly supervised learning methods so that we would be able to kind of like do the labeling with very cheap methods. So in our case, meaning that we would be able to kind of like just use bounding boxes to, to show where the certain kind of like pixels or, or, or the pixels belonging to certain objects are in the image and then using weekly supervised learning to kind of like then make that in, in more detailed representation. And then, uh, so, so at the moment in, in computer vision, uh, artificial intelligence research, so, so the, the uh, convolutional neural networks have been dominating the field for a long time, but now at, in the kind of like last few years, transformers have also entered into computer vision research that are the basis for, for uh, language processing research. Uh, and then for example, the chat GPT that, that is a lot, lot discussed uh, nowadays. And in, in kind of like computer vision research, they are also bringing many really good benefits. And then one of, of those is that they have something called self-attention mechanism that is able then to kind of like direct the, the concentration of, of the computer vision methods also for the relevant areas. And then so we are at the moment uh, now developing this um, vision transformer based instance segmentation methods then to be able to understand what there is in the um, image and, and kind of like get the exact boundaries of all the objects. And then in the coming um, kind of like research also then addressing the um, location of, of these kind of like pixels in, in, in three dimensions. And for that, as I said, we are developing weekly supervised um, deep learning methods that will uh, highly decrease the amount of time that we need for then labeling the, the training data. And, and then the last topic is, is also a kind of like sense of fusion research that is required when we are now working with safety critical uh, kind of like applications. So as said, we, we must know that everything is safe in the environment and therefore we can't rely on, on only one sensor providing the data. And then therefore, we at the moment, we are also developing deep learning methods fusing uh, sensors. So for example, inertial sensors also detecting the motion of the cranes together with the cameras doing the computer vision computation. And then kind of like with traditional fusion methods, we have been addressing many challenges coming out from doing some calibration of, of the system. So how the different sensors are. Um, kind of like set up with respect to others and also doing some time synchronization. And now with deep learning methods, we are then making the case easier. So we are learning how, how those kind of like the, the situation of, of these sensors are together and how, how the things are synchronized. And then we are able to get also improved kind of like fusion method out of that. And then at the end, as said, sustainable uh, crane oper operations for, for indoor premises. And that was my, my presentation, so thank you. Thank you, Laura. So uh, you started uh, your talk uh, with uh, talking about the sustainable effects and that the AI can have effects on many different uh, areas or more, uh, several pillars of sustainability. Uh, what do you think, if we think in terms of measuring those effects of AI, will we be able to measure somehow the sustainable effects of AI? Or is it just some 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 claims based on arguments that we, we will be able to do based on, uh, in order to really be able to show, for example, the benefits of AI for sustainability? Well, I, I would claim that in, in kind of like a small scale, we are able, of course, to, to see how, how things get safer, how we get kind of like the safety 
um, kind of like improvements or how, how we do things efficiently or how, how we get much less CO2 emissions. And I, I would say that in, in small scale, definitely yes. But what I, I still think is the challenge with kind of like AI and sustainability research in general is that we should be able to kind of like do these big systemic kind of like changes and then see the kind of like also the consequences in much larger scale. But I, I would say, yes, the, the, the simulations probably are really good for then being able to show what are the, the sustainability benefits from, from for different kind of like changes. I, I would claim that, yes, we would be able, not easily, but definitely, yes. Uh, and then you talk uh, a lot about the AI as a means to build machine perception. Uh, do you think that uh, what what other types of problems would AI potentially solve better than uh, than other existing approaches? For example, uh, would it uh, be helpful for planning or prediction problems? And especially, uh, there are many people who are interested uh, uh, in logistics. If AI could assist in estimating environmental effects of logistics, uh, for example, for entire su supply chains. Yeah, so, so yeah, thank you. You know that this is kind of like very, I, I really much like the question because, because I again saying that, yes, I, I would say that one, I think that one of the main strengths of, of AI for, for kind of like addressing the sustainability kind of like goals are the simulations. So, so we could kind of like try all different decisions that we would like to make and then see what are the, the resulting kind of like effects they are providing and then test all the different kind of like possibilities and then again see the consequences. And then for those we have uh, projects going on that are developing kind of like machine learning uh, concepts called re based on reinforcement learning, meaning that we are then able to kind of like simulate how different uh, decisions would affect uh, the, the systems. Uh, then one more thing you brought up in the uh, latter part of your talk is relates to data and data as the raw material for AI. So yeah. what's your take on the situation of data availability and sharing? So for example, either open sourcing the data and uh, uh, or whether that is uh, possible for industrial applications. And how is this uh, the challenges related to, for example, uh, data being, uh, uh, for, for example, related to uh, uh, information security, GDPR, but uh, as well as the uh, individual actors' own business uh, 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 viewpoints, how is this affecting the deployment of AI? Mm -hmm. Well, from kind of like research point of view, I, I think that it's it's kind of e easier for us to get the data because we work a lot with public providers. But I, I really well understand that the challenge for industries coming from data because I know that that's kind of like one of the most valuable assets that that companies have. But I I, I would say that I, I really kind of like highly recommend to, to to try to find some good solutions for sharing that because of course that's then accelerating the the, the, the kind of like development very well but but there definitely are many big still open questions i would say that the research community is at least working really hard to solve these kind of like privacy issues and, and security issues but but and unfortunately I, I still think that there are things open and, and that has to be addressed before before everything can can be kind of like work easily. Thank you, Laura. And okay. I think we will now move to the next presentation. Thank you. So the next speaker uh, will be Pekka Ulipong, the director of automation research at uh, Kalmar. And uh, uh, Kalmar is uh, strongly uh, also looking at uh, the both at the sustainability and AI aspects. So, Pekka, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yeah, quite much uh, already said, of course, and uh, Laura's presentation was interesting, of course. What is the difference um, in our applications is that we are now 
again in outdoor conditions and uh, I'm concentrating to the ports ports in my presentation I'm coming from Cargotech Corporation but I'm presenting the Kalmar business area and uh, we are making quite many equipments uh, for ports Oops. so this uh, kind of mandatory slide uh, from Kalmar um, presenting some numbers uh, how big uh, Kalmar is at the moment and uh, what have happened uh, recently. We have changed our strategy a bit and uh, so we are not making any more of these kind of big cranes. Cranes, what you can uh, see in this picture, for example, ship to saw cranes and uh, yard cranes. And we are concentrating to mobile machines nowadays and, uh, and uh, making those. And of course, we are making also automation systems still to the bigger cranes, but then we are utilizing other manufacturers, steel, steel structures and, uh, and that kind of mechanical structure what is available. And uh, you can see that, of course, uh, we have a wide range still of cargo handling solutions uh, in our uh, company. And of course, uh, service is a really important uh, part of our business and we are trying to grow that business uh, quite a lot and uh, of course uh, there's a quite a big relation to the service business if you think about sustainability things and what you can what you can do with the data especially and uh, how you can how you can uh, help our customers to have a more sustainable uh, production what, what they are doing and uh, this uh, nice red box is saying that uh, we are industry leader in eco-efficient cargo and material handling. And uh, I will show in the next slides and why, why I can say that one. And uh, what is driving, or what are the driving uh, forces uh, behind this uh, sustainability and eco-efficiency discussion? Of course, we have already heard quite many quite many uh, points uh, from uh, VDT presentation and from other university and uh, of course public and internal pressure is it is growing and uh, and if you think what is what is happening in every day and what we can see in news and uh, of course when we are hiring even even people that uh, this kind of uh, things are coming more and more important and of course we have heard already quite many uh, topics about the legislation how much that is uh, affecting and uh, what uh, what things are changing, what are changing in taxation, for example, and uh, and so on, and what what this emission trading means and uh, and so on. But uh, as already Link up already said that the cost is really efficient efficient factor and uh, how to how to push these forward is that uh, our customers are really calculating carefully that. Uh, what they can do and what kind of investments they can do. But I can say that uh, quite many things are changing at the moment and we are we are in the interesting period at the moment and uh, so many things are happening. And uh, of course, customer interest, uh, it is growing. Of course, I, I can say that uh, past, uh, in a couple of years past, the uh, customer were showing a nice uh, PowerPoints and uh, saying that uh, what might be the, uh, this sustainability targets, but uh, now they are really thinking uh, what are the concrete steps what they can they can take and uh, what kind of investments they, they should uh, should make and uh, to improve that kind of figures what they are presenting in, in the targets. And, uh, and we already heard that, uh, of course, big customers are first uh, investing to these things and then the smaller customers uh, are coming coming uh, next. And uh, and of course, customers customer are really putting more and more pressure. Of course, the, for the terminal operators who are really operating the terminal, and uh, they really want to see that what is happening inside the ter terminal and uh, what kind of figures they can they can show and what kind of KPI values they can they can show. And of course, we we have to remember in in the business side uh, what are the investor needs and how they see this. Uh, this uh, thing going forward. And of course, uh, there are quite many things and what we have been doing in past. And uh, we have to remember that, uh, of course, uh, the port is quite close to the big cities normally that you have to 
take care of uh, that kind of things like uh, what is the noise level of uh, your terminal, how much uh, banging you can hear because uh, there are houses and uh, people are living next to the port and uh, and also of course the uh, light emissions are also quite critical in, in some ports and uh, of course we already heard that uh, automation can also help in these kind of cases that uh, if you have automated machines for example what we are building they don't need these kind of uh, infrastructure lights to operate and uh, that is one way to of course lower that kind of emissions also but there are also interesting things what we are uh, pushing forward quite a lot of course maintenance and how to how to really need uh, less maintenance and how to really predict those things uh, what is going to happen and what is the healthiness level of the machine and what will happen next and these are really and we have to concentrate to all these it's not only how to save fuel and uh, how to really uh, minimize the CO2 emissions. And there are, there are quite many things what we are doing related to sustainability. And uh, this uh, slide is showing our history in, in the journey to uh, electrific, electrification and uh, how we have electrified our machines. Of course, our first machines uh, already 70 was uh, this kind of crane type machines because you can uh, utilize this kind of rail railing system and uh, you can you can have an optical fiber going going to the crane and uh, the same cable you can also feed also power power to the crane and uh, then that's uh, you can call it a zero emission crane in that sense and of course uh, when we are thinking about our mobile machines the forklift trucks have been quite a long time of course uh, fully electric versions because uh, they are working in inside the warehouses and uh, quite often in indoor conditions and uh, you don't uh, want to have this kind of combustion engine in that kind of environment but then you can see that uh, we made uh, already quite early 2000 uh, our first uh, electric uh, uh, stereo carrier and shuttle carrier and uh, we were quite early adapters in that one and we have learned quite a lot and uh, now we can say that we are already made, making third generation of our fully electric machines now. And on the right hand side, you can see that we have also electrified uh, our uh, other model models uh, like uh, reed stackers and empty container handlers and uh, all those. And we can, we can say that uh, from all our machine types, you can get the electrified uh, version already now. And uh, when we are when we have uh, interviewed our customers and of course these kind of things have changed quite a lot uh, in recent years and uh, there are quite many reasons of course uh, you know what is behind this one and uh, I want to highlight this climate change and they are really talking about uh, climate change because if you think about port uh, it's quite sensitive environment and you are next to the sea and uh, of course uh, you have strong winds and you have waves and uh, you have everything and uh, climate change is of course uh, affecting the those and you have to be aware that uh, you can't be any anymore only in reactive mode you have to really predict uh, what will happen and uh, how it's affecting to your operation in a port and uh, of course i want to highlight uh, still that uh, it's of course quite obvious that uh, what is the importance of port and uh, if the ports are not working of course uh, it is uh, really wondering the operation of the whole society around that one and of course we we know that uh, what have happened in in some places where you have had explosions and uh, quite many things have happened and uh, how much uh, the whole country for example can suffer suffer from that kind of things and uh, what can happen and of course uh, as mentioned already that uh, if you are thinking that the coastal area that uh, what can can happen and uh, also this kind of uh, short term uh, distribution dis disruption can really cause uh, quite uh, long lasting uh, ripple effects uh, uh, to the economy and uh, of course one example what uh, what we remember it was not so long time ago this uh, what happened in the Suez Canal and uh, channel and uh, what ha happened after that one and uh, we are still suffering from some things uh, what that accident uh, caused and uh, the next slide is presenting that uh, of course uh, 
as mentioned, that the ports are really close to the cities. And uh, of course, uh, if you think about uh, uh, these kind of cities like Hamburg and uh, Rotterdam and uh, so on, and the uh, ports and uh, cities, they are really cooperating with each other and they are doing things, uh, especially related to sustainability, quite a lot together. And uh, then it's uh, quite much about the data and uh, what kind of data they are sharing and what kind of uh, data is available and how to utilize it in, in AI. That is really becoming more and more important. And uh, in this regard, uh, the relation between cities and ports is becoming uh, increasingly direct, uh, as I said here. And, uh, and uh, so the ports are really investing uh, to be a part of, of this change. And, uh, but of course, we, we heard from VTT presentation that it's not so fast moving moving a uh, uh, ship and uh, it is quite slow process and they are really carefully thinking that uh, what to invest and when to invest. But uh, it has affected to our, our machines also that uh, now we are, our, uh, when we are thinking about a strategy carrier, for example, we are, we are selling much more hybrid machines uh, nowadays like uh, compared to the, this kind of old traditional diesel electric uh, electric stereo carrier. And uh, that has been a quite rapid change. And uh, now our customers are really talking about uh, fully electric uh, machines and they are piloting them and they are really testing those and uh, trying to learn that uh, how the operation is changing if you are changing, changing also the machines in the port. And of course, uh, Smart port as a term is uh, really uh, quite widely known and uh, very much a utilized uh, term. And uh, it is really quite much about the data and how, how you are utilizing the data and how, to, how you can learn from the data and how you can improve your operation. And already we heard from Laura how you can uh, improve the safety inside a terminal, of course, with the help of automation. But of course, in a manual operation, you can you can give more more situational awareness related data to the driver, for example, to the operators, and that is uh, quite much helping to make the operation more safe. And uh, I want to highlight here also that uh, we have also invested quite a lot, and uh, to really really have ideas and uh, how to utilize this kind of environmental data and how to measure measure that one and uh, so on the right hand side you can you can see one picture from Vaisala company and we have cooperated with Vaisala quite a lot and uh, how to collect this this kind of uh, weather related data of course uh, wind measurement is quite uh, very well known but uh, you can uh, have this kind of uh, Local local wind measurement quite easily, but uh, if you want to have a, a more distant and uh, if your distance is a bit longer, of course uh, these kind of companies like Weisala they have also solution for that one and how you can predict that what kind of uh, wind uh, wind you are going to have after 15 minutes or this kind of uh, microclimate uh, is coming more and more important also in terminals, and of course you can. Uh, uh, measure quite many other other things uh, with this kind of sensor but uh, then you can utilize utilize these and uh, like temperatures and uh, air pressure and uh, and uh, one interesting thing about the environment what we can measure with this kind of uh, laser based uh, sensors already we can really measure the fric friction as you know what is happening in uh, normal roads and uh, that you can really uh, help uh, help the maintenance guys that when when you need to utilize salt and when you have to clean clean the surface of the of the road and so on and we can we can utilize same technologies in 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 a port and in in terminals and uh, that is also, of course helping also this is making uh, related to automated machines and uh, when you see that the friction is uh, is lower than expected and you can lower the speed speed of the machine to that one uh, previously, of course, it was a human decision what, what was made and uh, now the uh, machine is slipping, slipping too much and now you have to limit the speed, for example. And you can see that uh, there's also 
UV radiation, what we are measuring in luminosity in, in some cases, can give uh, some valuable information that how to how to make it uh, improve the environmental safety in many cases. And of course, uh, these results uh, helps to understand emissions uh, derived from the activities carried out through a predictive system to support decision making. And uh, that is how we are helping our customers that we are providing more and more accurate information. But of course, uh, as already talked that uh, the quality of uh, data is important and uh, we have to be there, there that what is the quality of data and how much we can rely on that one and what kind of problems we might, might face if we are using that kind of data sources. But uh, this is uh, my summary slide. And uh, like I say that the relevance of these kind of uh, services and especially how we are utilizing data and how AI is uh, helping in that one, that is really growing, growing at the moment. And we are trying to uh, really make, uh, make uh, new services and uh, innovate uh, new services what, uh, what might help our customers. And uh, that is one reason why we are participating to this you know, the kind of EU-wide uh, uh, research uh, programs and uh, where we are learning together with our customers and uh, with other partners and uh, how to do this one and how to make these kind of calculations and uh, what we can do and uh, what kind of uh, service, uh, service business models we can create and uh, then how to make business with those. And uh, of course, the enrichment of the data, and we are really trying to find uh, many, many data sources, as we already heard that there are quite many open, open data sources also available and uh, related to pollution, for example. And uh, in many cases, our customers are already, already measuring also pollution levels. And uh, of course, water information is uh, really crucial that uh, not only water level, but uh, there are quite many other other things what we can measure from the water itself. And of course, meteorological uh, information are available in, in many places and they are coming more and more accurate. And uh, of course, uh, next steps, uh, how these are progressing in our business also and how we are utilizing uh, AI. Of course, we are really trying to collect uh, more and more information uh, to our cloud and we are utilizing AI in that environment and uh, trying to learn more and more. But of course, we already heard that uh, in all cases, it is not uh, so easy to have access to all data, relevant data, and even, even to our machine data. With our big customers, it's not, uh, not an easy case, but uh, of course, we are trying to go forward with that one. And of course, we are improving our arguments at why it's uh, so important to to collect the data and what kind of benefits our customers can get with that kind of data if we have access to the data and what kind of services we can then make uh, make to help uh, the own operation to be more productive and more safe. Okay, that was my last slide. Thank you very much, Pekka, for this interesting talk. So you talk a lot uh, talked quite a lot about data so do you think that in your industry the data is the biggest bottleneck for the employment of ai or are there some other maybe even bigger bottlenecks yeah that is a good point and uh, of course we already heard from laura's presentation that uh, what kind of um, for example camera information we have collected and how to annotate that one. And uh, that is one problem what we are facing also that uh, we have exactly the same situation that we are, our cameras are pointing downwards and uh, these kind of things are, are quite uh, quite severe in, in, uh, in AI development, what we are facing at the moment and uh, how we are utilizing AI. But, uh, but I think that uh, the biggest bottlenecks uh, are related to data, data really that, uh, if our customer sees that uh, they want to protect that, of course, uh, the famous saying is that, of course, they own the data when we have sold the system to our customer and uh, then they keep access uh, whenever they think that it is uh, beneficial for them. And uh, in some cases, even they open open the data 
data to us when, when they have some problems, but that, as you can guess that that is not helping us uh, so much and uh, how to really help uh, our customer in, in those cases. That is not easy at all. And uh, of course, uh, I think that uh, this uh, situation is improving because now our customers are understanding more and more that uh, why we need that one and how we can improve our products and how we can improve our services. And of course, in a field of legislation, so many things are happening at the moment in, in EU. Of course, we know this uh, data act and what kind of things are coming with that one and the uh, cyber resilience act and so on. And uh, so many things are happening at the moment and we have to be really aware that uh, how we can utilize and uh, what are the benefits of those uh, things and uh, or what, what is causing some issues for us. And uh, that's why we are really investing a lot of time to, to understand that uh, what are the limitations, what the legislation is putting, putting forward at the moment. Uh, so you talk uh, quite a lot about uh, ecological efficiency, uh, but how about cost efficiency? For example, you talk about fuel savings as well. Have you tried to measure the impact of AI initiatives on profitability? So, or can you comment something about payback time of AI investments or uh, AI related investments? Yeah, really, really good question. Of course, we started with uh, with that and how to how to really save fuel in uh, in uh, customer operation and uh, and of course we have uh, improved our machine fuel economy. Uh, with the help of data, and of course, we are we can also give some guarantees to the customer. And uh, if you have this model, messy model, and uh, if we can uh, assist you by collecting data and with our AI system, and we can guarantee this kind of uh, fuel saving in your operation. And uh, these things we have been doing uh, quite a lot, and we have learned quite a lot, and we are improving them. And uh, now we are making the same kind of service for our bigger machine like strato carriers and uh, putting the same kind of service to to that kind of machine and then you can really improve the fuel economy a lot and uh, the data is also and ai is helping a lot in that one and uh, of course uh, i don't remember by heart uh, the exact numbers that uh, but I can I can collect that kind of numbers because they are available in in our cloud environment. So you mentioned also now that you have learned a lot as I, I expect also as an organization. So uh, are there so, certain things that you have had to change in your ways of working or or thinking as an organization and team? So uh, are there some changes that you have had to do? in order to uh, look at this uh, this problem uh, from novel perspectives? That's a really good question. Of course, uh, <laughs> you know that uh, I have 20 years history in, in this uh, company. And of course, uh, if you think uh, 20 years back, and uh, of course, our company was totally different during that time. And uh, we were purely, I can say, that the machine manufacturer. and. Uh, and that was our uh, background and uh, what have happened after that one. Of course, uh, we have changed our organization and what kind of competencies and what kind of people we have in organization and uh, and so on. So many th changes have recently happened and uh, our organization is totally different compared to 10 years ago already. But what, what have happened recently and of course, uh, automation and these kind of things have also affected that uh, what kind of people we have and what we are doing in, in the company and uh, what kind of subcontractors we have and what kind of network we are building and uh, that has been a big change and of course uh, uh, Laura was uh, talking about systemic change uh, of course that's a nice nice word but uh, I can I can say that we have tried to do that kind of systemic change also in in our company, but of course uh, the change has been uh, quite slow, and of course uh, the changes are happening quite uh, fast nowadays. And you have to be aware, and uh, your organizational and uh, your changes must be faster. And you are you are really uh, 
predicting what is com coming next. And uh, that's why we have invested recently quite much uh, to foresight things and how to really predict that uh, what are the big next steps, uh, what is happening next, because uh, so many things are changing in logistic chains at the moment. And uh, you have to be really aware of uh, where to invest and uh, what is important for your business in, in near future. There's also a question in, uh, from the audience uh, that uh, uh, ask about how far are you in the journey of deployment and utilization of data and AI? So on a scale of one to five, where you are now and where you, uh, how do you see the uh, uh, look in the future? That is really hard question. <laughs> of course, we, as you can uh, guess that, of course, we have struggles with the data and what, is, what have been the quality of data because we have not utilized uh, previously uh, our data so much and um, that kind of uh, changes have happened and we have corrected uh, quite many things and uh, it has taken time. But of course, now I can I can see that uh, the speed of uh, development uh, is growing, growing at the moment and, uh, and we are getting new services and uh, we can implement new ideas much faster than previously. And uh, I think that is a big change. But of course, uh, if you are thinking about this kind of scale, that is a bit uh, hard to say, but uh, we are in first steps. Uh, I can say that uh, maybe number two or something like that is uh, is quite a, a realistic number, but uh, there are so many things we can, we can do in near future. But uh, I think that uh, we have quite good basis for that one and uh, we can get a quite much faster faster improvements quite quickly. Excellent. Uh, so maybe if you want to say a few words about that. So what do you see as the biggest uh, potential improvements in the let's say next five to ten years, which you hope to be able to uh, to solve? Maybe relate to sustainability or maybe something else uh, in the business. Yeah, of course, uh, always when we are asking from our customers that what is the number one priority, what, uh, what they say, it has been quite many years already productivity and uh, of course then, then comes the safety, but now, now the third one is the sustainability and uh, those uh, three things are really important and we are really uh, putting our uh, focus, focus to those three, three things and, uh, and of course uh, when you think about uh, automated terminal and you have heard already stories that uh, how to segregate uh, manual operation from the autom automated operation and uh, how to make it more safe and uh, now we have uh, invested quite a lot how to optimize really production because there are so many things uh, what are disturbing the operation and so many exceptions happening all the time and uh, how to really optimize that kind of uh, operation that is not so simple and uh, and we are doing quite much uh, of course uh, cooperation with the universities and with other partners and how to how to solve that kind of things uh, with the help of AI and uh, but we are in the beginning of that kind of journeys and uh, there are quite many many things what we can we can still learn and uh, and of course I, I think that what is happening next in our portfolio is that of course we are widening our automation portfolio to other uh, machine types that uh, maybe you have seen in the public that we have made an automated terminal tractor already and uh, and uh, forklift truck is coming next and so on and uh, so the portfolio is widening and uh, quite many things are happening in our machines and uh, what we can what are the capabilities of the machine and what kind of data they can provide and uh, how we are utilizing AI on board and how we are utilizing on its and how we are utilizing on cloud. There are so many places where we are, where we can utilize AI and uh, AI is helping, helping a lot in all those uh, levels. Thank you so much. And uh, now it's time to move to the last presentation of today. Yep. So the, maybe we can get the slides. So the last speaker today is 
Aki Elohimas. Aki is uh, the head of product uh, at Relex. And uh, we'll be talking today about sustainability in the consumer goods value chain and role of AI. Yep. Hi, everyone. Yep. My name is Aki Elohimas, and I'm a head of product at Relex Solutions. And I'm going to talk to you about sustainability in our in our business uh yeah let's start with a quick intro to the company to give some context on what we do so what relax solutions does we help consumer goods value chains to become more competitive by basically optimizing their processes uh the origins of the company is in in retail supply chain optimization but we have expanded uh, horizontally and vertically from there so our goal is to tackle these multiple areas supply chain promotions space workforce together they very frequently nowadays they are <clears throat> operated in a very siloed way but our goal is to make it in a unified way and that is because in the consumer goods value chain everything affects everything so it could be that for example how the supply chain is configured how how we move the goods through the chain that could affect, for example, what are the workforce needs in the warehouse on a given day, for example. And the same goes vice versa as well. So the labor availability can be a main constraint for the supply chain. So if there's only this amount of labor in the warehouse, it is a constraint that we need to be able to take into account. So our vision is, is to optimize both horizontally and the vertically the consumer goods value chain. Uh, we're an international growth company. Uh, we take a lot of pride in, in trying to be the best possible partner for our customers and being able to upfront measure of the value that we can give to our customers. So basically, uh, we take when, when we are in talks with our potential future customers, we often take in their data we can simulate how our product would behave and what would be the cost savings uh, for our customers. And there, then uh, if we sign and start the implementation project, then we already have like a good estimate on what sort of level of profit, profit we should yield to our customers. Uh, we are close to 2000 professionals in 18 offices around the world, headquarters in, in Helsinki, where the company was also founded right about 15 years ago or so and on the right hand side are some of our some of our customers i believe the figure is now closer to 400 than 350 so this might be a bit old information already that's about the company then a bit more context still on the product of what what is that we actually do and what what is that our customers get so as I mentioned, the um, origins of the company is in, is in forecasting and supply chain optimization. So uh, I'm going to speak mostly about that. And that product is served through one platform, which has basically two major components in it. One is, is workspace, what we call a workspace, which is basically a graphical user interface to slice and dice the data and visualize it with graphs and tables and and kind of understanding what sort of data you have and what if what, what should you do about it should you change something in your configuration and all of our use processes are also so what our customers day to day do in our system is is built on top of this this part of the product and then the other part is what we call business rules engine which is like a graphical no code platform which can do basically two things so it can filter data that is in the database and perform some actions to it. So here's a very simple example of a, we filter some products based on their classifications, and then we set some parameters for, for different product classes in this example. And this is a very simple example, much more complex examples exist. And this is actually the way that we uh, serve our product to our, to our customers. So when they start an implementation project, or when we start an implementation project, we start with a configuration that is basically configured with this uh, no-code platform. And 
all of this is powered by, by in-house developed database and query language and hosted in, in our private cloud. So we have multiple data centers in different parts of the world and, and we have a lot of servers to host this product. Then moving on to the sustainability side. Uh, so our focus in, in sustainability is, is, is working with our customers and try to decrease the food waste. And uh, that's kind of a logical choice for us because the focus of the company has basically from its inception been the grocery uh, retailer or grocery retail. So um, food waste is then logically quite a big chunk of, of grocery retailers um, uh, emissions as well. So that is our that is natural way for us, but also the very important way uh, or very important uh, thing to decrease the emissions for our customers because the food waste is a much much bigger uh, emission uh, kind of emission bulk than the transportation, for example, transportation of the goods. So that's why we have chosen the food waste as our main main way of of. Uh, driving sustainability through our customers. And I think Ville mentioned in the earlier presentation that uh, companies don't do anything if it's not profitable for them. Uh, well, fortunately for us, uh, the sustainability is, is aligned with money. So food waste is on top of it being like a big sustainability problem. It is also a very big cost for, for our customers or for retailers. So some some estimate is one to two percent of their revenue uh, is wasted in food waste for for grocery retailers so this helps us in a way that the sustainability is not something that is kind of on top of everything or some sort of a nice to have but it's actually in the very very core of what we do uh, and aligned with the monetary benefits or financial benefits that our customers are after so it helps us in our efforts, basically. Uh, one maybe interesting point to notice here as well is that if if it's a big if food waste is a big cost for retailers, it is still the sales for their suppliers. So there can be conflicting interests within the value chain because in a way, if retailer decreases their food waste, it is still sales for its suppliers. So it might not be the best interest for the supplier if you think them as separate entities that uh, their sales basically drop if waste would go to zero. Uh, to give a bit of context, typically in our implementations, we are able to reduce the food waste varying from 10 to 40 percent while keeping the other KPIs on par. Uh, so, of course, the amount of what we can do or our effect is, is dependent on, on what is the current state of the customer. So some of our customers, they work with Excel. Some of our customers have worked with pen and paper to begin with. And some of our customers have worked with sophisticated solutions from our competitors earlier. So when they implement Relax, it of course depends on what was the kind of baseline level uh, before. Uh, when estimating that that reduction figure, but on high level, that 10 to 40 percent is is what we have been able to get, and that while at least keeping other KPIs on par is is an important point because it's not only about food waste. So there are very there are very many objectives that the retailers are able to or are aiming to uh, fulfill. So. I would say that at the moment it is not uh, realistic to say that we would be able to cut the waste to exactly zero. Uh, basically, the main there are two main kind of or the main main costs are the waste, uh, but then the other cost is the or uh, the other thing that the, our customers need to think about is the service level. So if they would cut the waste exactly to zero, they would hurt their service levels. Uh, so much that it would not be a good decision for them. So therefore, it is not a goal ultimately to get the waste even zero. And of course, the other 
uh, perspective into that matter is that there are inherently some buffers in the uh, fresh goods supply chain that these buffers and lead times they will they will kind of inevitably in some places lead to waste so this was to give a bit of context on the sustainability and how do we think about the sustainability through our customers then the next part of my presentation would be the ai part so what we what we currently do to make this better how do we how do we in concrete terms uh, aim to reduce the uh, emissions in our customers businesses and in our view currently it comes down to mainly two points so one is forecasting so in fresh foods that expire and might go to food waste the supply chains are usually very fast and, and agile and, and reactive so there's not there there is no high inventories and the lead times are uh, relatively fast compared to other product types which means that the role of forecasting is is more important in 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 these product categories so that's one part but then the actual inventory control and and there is still some room to improve like what is the actual optimal amount that we want to order on on each day so the inventory control is then the the other part of the equation so if we first go into forecasting basically our approach into that has been using bayesian generalized linear model with maximum posterior maximum a posterior estimation uh, and that is because we we have tried multiple different models over time uh, different ways to forecast but this until now or this this has proven for us to yield an optimal trade-off between accuracy computation time uh, transparency configurability controllability those kinds of things so what is pretty important to understand in our context is that the scale of the computation and level of detail is, is very high so uh, we basically need to operate on a level to basically consider that our customers could have tens of millions of we call them product locations so an individual product in individual location that's one uh, kind of that's one that's that's one instance of level where we need to do forecasting and replenishment so what that basically means is that our customers can have tens of millions of these product locations and each of them can have uh, different demand characteristics and each of them can also have different uh, kind of business drivers or replenishment decisions or, or business decisions made upon them so what that means is that we need to be extremely good at, at uh, automating automating things and we cannot spend time on manually analyzing much so the high automation level needs to be there as well as the uh, what is important is that the uh, kind of it, it's not enough if we are able to on average forecast most of the products right we need to be right we need to be relatively good level on all of the products so even if we would get like 99.9 percent .9 of the products forecasted well if that 0.1 percent fails miserably that is very problematic for us and that is if you think about the spoiling products that is like logical in a way that if we like if our forecast is very like let's say it overshoots a lot then if we automatically order based on that forecast it will lead to a lot of waste and a lot of cost for our customers so therefore we can more easily tolerate like small forecast errors but we cannot tolerate big forecast deviations and because of that scale also the computation time is pretty important for us uh, transparency is something that is very important for us our customers they want to understand why the forecast is what it is how it is calculated why the model ended up in this kind of forecast and not that kind of forecast so the understandability and transparency are also important uh, this 
maximum a posterior estimation, by the way, is one way also to think that this is the way that we are sustainable in our own operations. So basically what that means is that we aim for a point forecast and we, on the right-hand side graph, we don't aim to find the entire distribution for the demand. We are just interested on the maximum point of it. Uh, and what that means is that the distribution is something that we then approximate from the point forecast. And that saves us computation time, which then saves, like in our scale, it saves electricity in the data centers and, and so forth. So it, so it is also a, also a sustainable choice for us to do it that way. Um, yeah, so in addition to the actual regression model that calculates the forecast, our forecasting machine comes packed in with some data analytics and data cleansing tools. And one example is on the right hand side, lower graph, uh, what we call a level shift detection. So usually the data that is given to us that comes from our customers, it's usually not perfect. So there can be some, there can be many things that are missing from that data. And for, for such instances, we need to use this level shift detection basically to be able to survive and not not explode the model so that if there's some if there's some unexplained uh, shift in demand, we like to understand that before we fit, uh, fit the model. So for example, that is done to get the promotional uplift right. So in order to estimate the promotion uplift that happens during the unexplained level shift, we need to be able to tell that this period in the middle of the chart is now some, some unexplained level shift. This is about forecasting, then about the inventory control. Uh, I'll showcase a couple of things. So first thing is related to the batch composition of the inventory and the purchasing behavior of the consumers. So what we are aiming to do here is that uh, it's pretty typical uh, situation that when there's multiple expiry dates of the same product. So let's say some packed meat product, for example, if there's multiple expiry dates in the shelf at the same time, then some of the consumers will take the newer batch and, and some of the consumers will take from the older batch. But we need to understand this behavior. So typically it's like 80% take the oldest batch and 20% take the newest batch or something like that. So we need to understand this behavior because that then of course uh, affects how, how the inventory how the inventory is, is consumed over days. And that will also help us to understand that what likely is the um, composition of, of different batches uh, currently in our inventory. So that will basically help us having more visibility in the data that we have and therefore help us make better decisions. And there has been quite long talks of, of barcodes that could have the batch level information in it. So like a 2D barcodes. Uh, but they haven't been widespread. Uh, there hasn't been widespread adoption of those at this point. So therefore we have come up with this estimate or estimation method uh, to kind of work around the problem. And then the other, um, other interesting part of the inventory control algorithm is the actual um, actual order optimization calculation, which in our case aims to calculate such replenishment orders that minimize costs in the periodic review system, which is our operating environment basically. And those costs are the, or basically it's um, cost of lost sales. So if we, if we don't fulfill the demand, that's like thought as a cost here. And then the, the waste cost is, is the other cost. So we aim to find a minimal point and that can be <clears throat> seen in the below graph uh, that we basically have two costs and then the minimum is usually, or the, <clears throat> or the cost function is looking something like this, like a curve with a minimum point somewhere. And <clears throat> in that calculation, this is, this is our own development. So it's, uh, quite recent, our own Relax Labs driven development, and it, it considers the batch composition and the purchasing behavior. So the upper figure, 
we automatically consider those because they are of course meaningful and important parts of that uh, uh, or it is an important factor to consider that if 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 customers or if consumers pick the products differently it will also affect how we need to order it in order to optimize the costs but then of course the batch sizes delivery schedules spoiling times and the forecast and its uncertainty so these are kind of describing the tools that we currently use to <clears throat> currently use to minimize waste in our customers uh, but then next i could go through some of my ideas on what future challenges there could be uh, <clears throat> one could be dynamic pricing so basically enabling increasing the appeal of of some products that are uh, going to expire soon so this is quite manual work now from at least based on my experience uh, people are going with the stickers and putting putting stickers into products and it's a lab, laborious task so this could be one way to make it more make it more appealing for the retailers but also for the consumers and, and help to cut waste but still help getting profits for the retailers then other point is a bit more organizational in a way that collaboration within the value chain so there's a lot of stakeholders how we could enable some a holistic optimization over the entire chain so that everyone benefits so this kind of links back to the earlier point of of retailers waste is its suppliers sales so how <clears throat> how the different stakeholders should collaborate and share the profits of that collaboration that's one interesting thing to me at least uh, third one is <clears throat> is something that I've been working on lately quite a lot. How to build great AI products that solve problems at scale, but still enable transparency, human interaction, and control. So, as I mentioned, for at least in our operating environment, that transparency, understandability, human interaction, control, those kinds of things are are important for our customers at the moment, at least. So, how to make how to make the products such that they are very easy to use and especially easy to use for people who hasn't haven't uh, studied like statistics for 15 years so the users of our software are not uh, researchers or data analysts or data scientists so how to bridge that gap basically and make the make them ai products that are mathematically very complex still make them easy to use uh, for anyone and then the fourth point is is kind of a generic but reflecting on some sort of recent developments past three years or so how to cope with dynamic environment with unseen phenomena so case supply disruptions inflation pandemics so there has been a lot of i think that past three four years there's been an increasing amount of uh, kind of complexities reactivityness uh, needed in 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 our environment at least so how to cope with that better so our current solution to that is to try to be as adaptable and, and reactive and, and fast as possible and that is a good way to tackle it i think but could there be something else something more intelligent to cope with those situations situations where we haven't seen something before we hadn't seen the pandemic before it hit the inflation i think these levels of inflation has earlier been like in the 70s or so so there is no data on those those topics so what could we do this is my presentation so three things to remember from this presentation our sustainability efforts revolve around reducing food waste that is our way in sustainability our current way is perfecting forecasting and inventory control to minimize it. And in the future, there can be different sorts of solutions that vary from new fancy AI tools to collaboration models and human computer interactions. Thank you. Thank you, Aki. Uh, so there are again uh, questions also from the previous. Uh, and let's start with. Uh, 
with those, but actually uh, one of the things that has been raised up is the conflicts of different actors in uh, optimized value chains. So, and how that may affect data, how, uh, how, how to handle a, a, the bigger situation. You are also working with multiple competing clients. So uh, are there uh, any problems with that? For example, about the uh, uh, data as the asset point of view, are there any ways to use maybe data across customers and what kind of business models for collaboration uh, you can see in the future? Yeah, that's a very good question. And yes, there is problems. So we have been thinking of that. It, it would be, of course, from like data scientists point of view, it would be interesting to let's group everybody's data and try to find some some common patterns among it or from it. But of course, there's there's concerns in, in customers. They don't want to share their they don't want to share their data to their competitors. And and in many places there's also laws. So competi com competition laws are are quite strict and, and they of course don't want to risk it. And it is it goes also very detailed that I think that because you can from some for example some estimated model you can basically understand that or estimated model and its parameters it is basically data so you cannot even if you don't share the kind of raw input data you cannot share the model itself even because that's also data in a way because you could be able to interpret something from like let's say if we use regression regression model so if you look the regression coefficients coefficients you might be able to interpret something from them so yeah it is a problem and i don't see in or that's something that would require further thinking but at the moment we are working on like we don't share data between customers obviously so it is just all, all of the customers have their own environments and so forth. So it is it is separate, totally separated for, for everyone. Then another issue uh, that you are working with kind of, I mean, you are in some sense an AI provider when we see AI uh, in a wide sense for your own customers who are the retailers. So do you see that once uh, customers start to use these tools do they need to change their operation from the customer point of view and then how mature uh, the sector is in its use and deployment uh, of these kind of models and, and for example forecasting models optimization models and so on um yeah so there's two two questions so do the customers do they need to change something in their operations and then how how um, how ready they are to take AI solutions in the use. So the first question, um, yes and no. It's like a good answer to any question is yes and no. Uh, but yeah, as I mentioned that, <clears throat> so we, our way of delivering our product to our customers is through like a sort of what we call like best practice configuration. So we basically harness all of our customer base. We harness the good practices that our customers do globally and, and basically try to, try to build sort of a uh, ready-made template that this is how retail optimization should be done in any environment. And oftentimes our customers also want to understand that we are doing this. Is, is this good way or should we do something else? Uh, so... I would say that in in large part we uh, the customers um, they are happy to take our best practice stuff into use because it has been tested globally in different sorts of environments. But of course, every customer can have some customer specific things, which is then our platform is extremely flexible, so they can then or we can together with the customer then configure some some customized solutions for them, and also our point in general is to give power to our customers to do it themselves. So we also, once the customer learns to use our system, we want to take a step back and let them to do that. So we don't need to be there every time, like customizing everything for them, but they can do it themselves. And then how ready customers are willing to 
take AI solutions into use. I think that there is in general uh, quite a lot of uh, interest and, and and talk in in getting these AI solutions into use. Uh, but of course, there is some amount of change management needed as well because it might require, for example, different skill sets to be able to understand how some models work and so forth. So the in some sense, some some things might might change, and and it might require some work on the customer side and organizational side. So it's not something. It's not then. It's not nothing. It it requires some work. But in general, yes, there is quite a lot of interest in in digitalization, the operations, and taking more advanced technologies into use. Thank you. Uh, so maybe one more question relates to your. Uh, uh, view on the methods that are available from the scientific community. So, are there some problems with the with the methods that you are currently employing? For example, you mentioned that that the models that uh, that are based on data may be uh, slow to adapt, that they are faster changing environment, or uh, or do do the kind of the models and methods already exist and you have to just implement them or are there some fundamental challenges you have with the current AI methods? Mm. Well, that's also a yes and no questions. In in many of the application areas, the uh, there's a lot of, lot of um, kind of literature uh, around the world and, and a uh, lot of methods that are widespread and unused in many cases. So oftentimes we don't need to reinvent the wheel and we don't want to reinvent the wheel oftentimes. But then again, also there might be uh, that in our the way that we operate or the way that we uh, the way that we have built our product can pose some challenges or pose some challenges that are not uh, kind of widely known or that there is no um, there is no ready-made solution for for something, so in those cases we we need to do also a bit more bit more groundwork uh, on it. So maybe a good example is is um, at least I haven't seen much uh, that sort of a product, but one one product that we have is that uh, we basically we aim to optimize. Uh, and, and automate the creation of the what we call or what the industry calls planograms, which is like the this is how the shelf in a retail store should look like, like a layout plan for a shelf. So we aim to automate and optimize that plan, basically. And that is not something that I have seen a lot of research papers on, for example. So some of things require quite a lot of development and we have quite we have some team of 35-ish um, data scientists and machine learning engineers to researching both researching new methods, but also researching the applica like applications for methods. So, but most of the things that we do is is applying some method to our business problem. So we are not like a research house. We're more like a product development team. Thank you so much. So, and uh, this ends the uh, talks uh, for today. And maybe we can take a very, very quick look. Uh, Hanumaya, if you can share the last slides. So first, I'd like to thank you again, all our speakers for exciting talks. I'd also like, uh, to thank the audience uh, for interesting questions uh, and I'd like to remind you all that the recordings of these talks will be available in approximately one week after after this meeting. So what we have seen that there are quite a many things where the uh, there's a interesting new works in the intersectional sustainability and AI and in some uh, side, we could see to be quite early in the journey so far, but I'm not sure if that's entirely true. Automatic planning and optimization is already employed in supply chains. And even if there are some new AI tools, 
that may improve these capabilities, but they are already there. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we've seen a few talks that relate more uh, as an AI, as an enabler to make the move from automation uh, to autonomous systems. When we are having physical uh, systems uh, that are able to uh, provide value for the logistics chain. And that is probably an area where we will see uh, on a bit longer term uh, great changes uh, for logistics and supply chains uh, as uh, uh, caused by AI. So looking at the challenges of using an AI, uh, using AIs and data uh, is the challenge of, uh, of collaboration and uh, uh, especially in terms of data. And it seems that uh, things that have come up uh, uh, multiple times during today is that there are different ways where more widespread sharing of data uh, would be able to uh, help uh, actors in different parts of the value chain and the supply chain. But we still need to uh, develop better models of collaboration that would be distributing the profits across their, all the collaborators. And this is something that uh, would still need to be developed, uh, both uh, from a business side and maybe partially also from the technological side. Um, and then next slide, please. So FKI is very happy uh, to collaborate uh, with uh, all the, uh, in this exciting field. And uh, there are lots of experts uh, in FKI in various different areas of AI. And so please don't hesitate uh, to contact me or uh, the FKI Industry and Society Program at isp.fki.fi if you have any further uh, information or contact requests. Uh, thank you everybody for attending today and I wish you all a nice spring.